<laughs> okay, let's switch gears and talk about the plans that God has for us. When are they going to happen? Yeah, God's, <laughs> God's plan for your life is good coffee. But um, I, re- I remember back in the day when I used to do talk back on this station, one of the things that I would get called up and asked most consistently is how to know what God's plan is for my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's something that I like to come back to every now and then because I know a lot of people, in particular tradi- Christian traditions, feel a lot of pressure about knowing what it is that God wants me to do. How do I know what it is that God wants me to do and how do I do it? There's this feeling that there's this exact plan for our lives and that there's the danger that we might miss the boat, that we might uh, we might get it wrong. It's like a hidden path that you've got to try and uncover. Yeah, you've got to, got to get it absolutely right. Uh, because often because we're reading in the Bible, we're reading about amazing personalities where it's very clear that God had quite a direct plan for their life. One of the things mistakes that we make when we read Scripture, though, is I think we forget that we're reading the exception, not the norm. So we read about the life of Moses. We don't read about the life of every other Israelite that Moses helped. And God had a very specific plan for the person of Moses, and he had a a plan for the people of Israel, but that doesn't mean that he had a very specific plan for every single Israelite. He'd had a plan for them, for each of them, but not necessarily a very specific plan. We read the story of Peter. We read the story of Paul in the New Testament. We see people for whom God had a very specific plan, but then we're not necessarily reading the story of every single person in the New Testament who chose to uh, follow Jesus. So there's part of me that wants to go, if you're sitting there feeling stressed about getting God's plan for your life, understand that there are some good broad boundaries that you get to work with. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can do that in pretty much every setting. And then have a think about what it is that lights you up. What is it that I get ignited about when I think about what I could do in my life? Back when I used to do talkback and I'd speak to young people, they'd generally talk about wanting to be a pastor, a missionary, or a youth pastor, or a worship leader, you know, the supposed rock stars of the church. Now, can I just say, as a minister, we are not the rock stars at all. It's not a job that you want unless you're really, really stupid or feel <laughs> specifically called to it. So have a think about what really lights you up. And I can almost guarantee you that God probably doesn't want you to do the opposite of that. That if if there's this thing that you're interested in, excited about, science, maths, English, cleaning toilets, whatever it might be, if there's something that excites you, every there's every chance that God has built you for for that thing. I always remember um, my dad would say around this kind of stuff that like God's voice is usually louder the more important the decision. Mm. You know, like, because you, you want to try and figure out where do I go? And it's often when you're at a stage where maybe there's like um, different paths you could take. So say like you finish school and then you're like, well, now I have to make a decision. Do I go work? Do I choose a something to study? Or what does God want me to do, mm. you know? And... Um, yeah, I, th- I think it's good to include God in all of those things and put it before him. But really, like, he calls us to be good stewards of the gospel, right? In our lives, yeah. whatever we end up putting our hand to, whatever that may be, we're called to live the Jesus way in that moment. And when there is something specific that he's going to speak to you about or call you to do, it'll probably be pretty clear when he when he speaks to you. Yeah, I think what so. What does that look like, though, when he's pretty clear as to that's where you're supposed to be? Ah, oh. I think most Christians would probably know a burning sense of 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 a direction that I that I need to go in. Uh, one one person when I was talking about uh, the possibility of getting into ministry, I remember our national superintendent of the Wesleyan Church. I think he said something like, "Run away," and if you feel like you can't run away, then God is probably calling you to it. If you can't get away from it, God is probably calling you to it. Now. I remember growing up saying, I'll never be a minister. As a little kid, I was saying I would never be a minister. What kid feels like they have to say, I'll never be a minister? So I was running as hard as I could away from this thing that that there was quite a specific Mm. uh, call to. But I, I would say to most people, when you're faced with two options... And it doesn't feel like God is burning in any direction. Uh, simply go, if I go in this direction, how can I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? And how can I love others? And if I go in this direction, how can I do it in that direction? There will be answers in both of those directions. So in both of those directions, if you can find answers to those questions, there is no wrong there. So it's just which one do I prefer? Do you encourage people to talk to other people just to make sure or around their decision-making, or do you encourage people to sit still and 
try and figure it out themselves? Uh, I would say there's probably a little bit of both that goes on. If we're talking about the big decisions in, in life, none of us hopefully are completely isolated. Hopefully we've got other people around us whose opinions we trust. You know, talk to those people and let community speak into, into those decisions as well. But then there's, a, I think, a place to sit in the silence as well and listen to whatever's going on in our heart or our head about the decisions that need to be made. One thing I've noticed with myself is that I, I tend to have a better sense of when something isn't right mm. than rather than so much when it is. You know, like I can, something in my spirit or your conscience or whatever, you sort of are like, this isn't it or this isn't what I'm called to do or this isn't where I should be living or whatever it is. But then maybe I don't have the same sense around when I am in the right space or doing the right thing. Yeah, there's an old there's an old form of Ignatian decision making. So going back to Saint Ignatius and his spiritual uh, disciplines, and one of the things that he advised was to uh, almost pretend that you've made a decision in one direction, and sit with it for a week. Ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate uh, that decision for you, but sit as if you've made the decision in that direction for a week or two and have a look at the feelings that you have. Take notice of the feelings that you have, how it, how it affects you, and then do the exact same in the other direction. Make the decision in favour of the other direction for a week or two. And again, sitting with the Holy Spirit in that and have a look at how it makes you feel and what happens for you. And chances are that if you do that, you're going to see which way is clearer. We're going to segue out of the plans that God has for us. And you you articulate this better than I do. So how are we going to do that in this next segment? Yeah. Well, we talked about uh, God's plan for our life and, and listening for God. But I, I think then uh, in order to do that, we've got to learn how to see God at work and to see God in the world around us. And many of us have been taught... And I realize there's an irony here based on the conversation that we just had off air because there's, there's, in my personal life, I'm at a time where I want something more of the mountaintop experience of God. I'm someone who teaches and encourages people to see God at work in the everyday, the general experience of the goodness of God in the mundane and the ordinary. And so the way that I described it to you off here was uh, there's the general experience of the Israelites, their experience of God, and then there's Moses on the mountaintop. Usually what I encourage is people having that, looking for that general experience of God, learning to see God in the everyday around us, uh, because I think we're often taught in uh, some, uh, some circles that only the mountaintop experience is a valid experience of God, and we need to seek that at all times. But I'm at a point in my life where I want the mountaintop experience. So there's an element where I'm climbing the mountain to have that uh, experience. I won't go into that. But I think more of us need to learn how to see God in the everyday and to experience God in the everyday, to understand that God is there when you're drinking your instant coffee with oat milk. God is there when you're having conversations that are difficult, conversations that are that are good, but we are we are overloaded in our world, and so we struggle to see it. And we're addicted. We've been taught to be addicted to stimulation. And so then God must feel like something that stimulates. And so we go along to church, and we're looking for that uh, big experience that we can have as we're singing or, or as the preacher tries to light us up, or we're turning on the worship music and putting up putting it up loud in the car because we want that experience, or we're reading scripture hoping that we're going to have this this big experience. Now, you can have those experiences, but I don't think that's what God is calling us to in the everyday. I think the challenge for the Christian life is to understand that God is always present and always to be experienced. So it's just a question of how we turn our attention uh, that way. Maybe... Um it becomes challenging for people when your life gets a little bit smaller. I'm thinking of like, um, especially, you know, when you have children mm. and you go from, I don't know, probably doing a lot more stuff and then suddenly you've got kids so you're at home all the time and your world becomes very much about them, especially when they're small, and trying to work out like, yeah, where do you see God in in the everyday when it's quite like stressful and all this kind of stuff, but his his goodness is there just as much as it is in any other environmental place that you'd find yourself and it's like that switch in your mindset I guess of what you're talking about instead of chasing experience chasing the ordinary and seeing God at work through through all places yeah. well that's actually a good point that Bjorn brings up with busy households mm. you know a young parent who might be listening right now or a parent who might be listening right now who's just got a stressful household with young children they don't know what's going on 
they, there's noise around them where they can't feel God. Mm. So what do you say to that person or those people? Yeah, I think for anybody, no matter what, what your level of, of life experience at the moment, it's an intentionality to bring ourselves back, no matter what's going on, to bring ourselves back to a reminder that God is with us, God is good, and God is there to be noticed in everything, including the stress and the, the mess. So for someone who has a lot more space in their life, then they might be able to dive into some reminders that are a little deeper and richer and, and take a little bit longer. Uh, so, for instance, at the moment, um, there's a prayer rhythm that I'm doing seven times a day, but I have space in my life to be able to do that, and that's relatively involved. For others, it might be an app that just gives you a quick reminder in a Bible verse. At, at a few points in the day, it's finding ways to pull our mind back to intentionally looking for God. So a stressed-out mum or dad who's got little kids running around, it might just be a quick reminder on the phone with a little verse that you can look at just for a moment that reminds you that it intentionally brings your mind back to oh yes God is present even here in the mess now that doesn't mean that I then have this peaceful ethereal experience <laughs> that is all calm and all of a sudden I'm the parenting yes. guru but it's just a reminder that in the middle of my stress yeah God is here that's awesome um I, just as you were talking there I, I, I without even thinking and noticing I find like I can discern between at church where I get all the worship music and that's very important to me but I also like walking after I finish work yeah. and being in the still of walking up a mountain and just, and just taking God in there. So there's the worship as you talked about, but then there's the still. And I think if you can, and it's not, not you know, busy parents find it very hard to find that stillness, but if you can, you would recommend that be still for a little bit? Totally. And I think those two things importantly work together. What we do individually on our own, and there might be seasons in life where there's lots that we can do, that works with the communal and the worship that we do together. And sometimes we need that just as a reminder that God is God is present. So as I go back into my daily, uh, I'm reminded that God is there. Before we wrap up, uh, you, you're here next week? Yes. But you're not here the week after? Correct. Okay, So because I'm not here next week. So oh, I'm going to miss you. Yeah, well, I'm going to miss you. Two I'm, weeks I'm, without you. What I'm, am I going to do? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> hug it out, you two. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, but uh, I'll be here. Yeah, guys, you, I know. And, and beyond, and Bex will we'll wish you all Phew. the best for for a holiday. But you're going to get a well deserved break in a couple of weeks' time. I am. Can you I'm share a little bit of that. It. You're, you're going overseas. I am. I'm Good. going to Rarotonga with my family. It'll be nice. Well, Riv, have a great time. You deserve a break. Thank you. And I'll see you when you get back.